Just a small brief introduction uh, to our message this morning. First we see in chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians uh, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And then we go on and we see Christ as truly how he truly is. A member of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see him as all man and all God. We see that he is supreme over all creation, for he is the creator. We see him supreme in our redemption, for he's our redeemer. We see him as supreme in the church and over the church, for he is the one who gave himself and shed his blood for the church. And now, as we come to chapter 3, Paul insists that Christ must be preeminent and supreme in our daily lives, in our lifestyle. Our message this morning, as you see, is titled, The Upward Walk. An Upward Walk, How We Live. Before we continue, let's come to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, we do humbly fall down before you, Lord. I realize that there's nothing of myself or there is nothing that I could say or do this morning that would be worth anything. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And it is only through His Word, the Scripture, that is all truth. Help us to have open our eyes, our blinded eyes, open our deaf ears that we might see and hear what you have to teach us this morning. We ask that you will teach us by your word and your Holy Spirit. We rely upon you and you alone, Father. We pray that we might be uplifted. We pray that our walk might be strengthened that we come to know you better and more. And Father, that you, above all, would be glorified. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll begin, and we'll probably camp mostly in the first four, four verses of chapter 3. But we're going to read the first 16 verses because we will be there off and on uh, through the message. So those of you who have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3 of, of uh, Colossians. And we'll read there the first 16 verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator." Here there is not Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. 
uh, see, I'm sorry, bearing with one another, and if one eat, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to the Lord. You know, today, we like to look to the left and to the right. We like to see what's going on around us, don't we? We like to know what's going on around us. But this morning, we don't want to just look to the left or the right. We want to look up. We want to have that upward look and downward. Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Before we as Christians can reach the world for Christ, we have to first leave it. we got to leave this world. First, in Galatians 1.4, Paul said, Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age. We are Christ's kingdom, which is not of this world. And John 18.36 tells us, Jesus answered, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. In 1 John 5 and 4, he says, for, John says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Even though that you and I live in this world physically, spiritually, we are citizens of heaven. Our home's not here. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our position. We're in Christ in heavenly places. That's where we're seated this morning, positionally. 1 Peter 2.11 says that we are aliens and strangers in a foreign land. As I said, this is not our home. We're just passing through. Until we realize this basic truth and live it, we will be ineffective in reaching the world with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will do no good unless our lives are transformed. It is only when we rise above the world that we can appreciate the spiritual poverty in which most people live and we learn to fix our eyes and our minds on heaven. Our blessings are in heaven, Ephesians 1, 3. The angels are in heaven, in Ephesians 3, 10. Christ is in heaven, Ephesians 1, 20. We, through our union with Christ, in His resurrection, exist in heaven, Ephesians 2, 6. All these scriptures provide a backdrop for Paul's message in chapters 1 through 4. There are five features that will help unfold the power of an upward walk here on this earth. And there are five, and they start with an R, five R's, as Phil would use. The reminder, the responsibility, the resource, the reason, and the revelation. He starts off here and he says, If you then have been raised with Christ. If denotes doubt, doesn't it? And it's better translated since. So it, we should read it like this. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Because you and I as believers have been raised with Christ is not in doubt. It's a fact. 
The verb here means to be co-resurrected. So we're co-resurrected with Christ. We're heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Him. We as believers are entered into Christ's death and His resurrection at the moment of our salvation, the moment that we believe on, his, on the gospel, or in the gospel. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. In that verse, Paul shows us that the union with the believer and the Lord, that we have a shared life. Jesus Christ is living through us. That's our lifestyle. It should be. Paul emphasizes the centrality of Christ throughout Colossians 3, 1 through 4. He uses phrases like with Christ in verse 1 and 3, and where Christ in verse 1 and 4, and also with Him in verse 4. Unfortunately, so often we fail to understand and pursue the fullness of God, of Christ, because we may not know the Word, or we may not apply the Word properly, or we are intimidated into thinking that we need something more than Jesus alone to live our Christian life. Why is that? Here in verse 16a, in, in Colossians here, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell, dwell in us richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. We have to spend time in this Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us about this. It says, it says all, all uh, Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, or is God, is God breathed? I should be able to quote it. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot here. I should be able to quote this verse. I, I know it. All scriptures God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for the training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We have to know the Word of God. Otherwise, will then fall into false philosophy, which is, in Colossians 2.8, tells us this. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, an empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Human reasoning. We can't pay any attention to that. We need to know our Bibles. Worldliness. First John, at least chapter 2, 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the sinful pride of life. They're not of the Father, but they're of the world. We need to do away with the world. And legalism, Colossians, again, in 2, 20 through 23, it says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? That's what happened to the old Judaizers. In 23, he says, These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion. Legalism. We need to know the Word of God. Paul reminds the Colossians and us that we have been raised with Christ. We are no longer living the old life before our salvation, but our sinful passion is controlled and conquered by the power of the indwelling Christ. That's how we live, by the power of the indwelling Christ that lives within our hearts. 
Number two is the responsibility. Here he says, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. The present tense of the word, zeteo, keep on seeking, indicates a continuous action, doesn't it? It's something that we continue on. We don't just do it once and it's done. We keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is. The pattern of the believer's life is to be preoccupied with the indwelling Christ. The pattern of the believer's life, we should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And he says, all these things shall be added to you in Matthew 6.33. We are to be so preoccupied with heaven and with the one who reigns there, with his purposes, his provision, and his power. Again, in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust will destroy, and where thieves will break through and steal. But he says, Lay up for our, yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust will not destroy, and thieves will not break through and steal. He says, for your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And you know, it's, I found it, it quite interesting that um, you don't have to be around somebody very long until you find out really where their treasures lie. It's what they talk about. I've been with some people, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is something from the Word of God. It just blesses my heart. But I've also been around people that never mention the Word of God. And that breaks my heart. And this morning, our lives should be lived with Him in mind, that upward walk, not according to this life. The things, <clears throat> again, in 3.5, here in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. He said, Put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, lying. It kind of reminds me of a story that I heard one time about a little boy. And we can probably all relate to this story because we all were little boys or little girls at one time. Whose mother heard him in the kitchen one night after it was bedtime, supposed to be asleep. Well, she heard him there and she said, uh, Billy, where are you? And he answered and he said, I'm in the pantry. What are you doing in the pantry? And then she heard the cookie jar lid open. She said, you're not supposed to be in the pantry. You're not supposed to be eating the cookies. What are you doing? And he said, I'm fighting temptation. <laughs> yeah. But you know what, my friend, this morning? That's the wrong place to be to fight temptation, isn't it? Don't fight temptation next to the cookie jar if you're not supposed to be in the cookies. And so the illustration here is that if you have a problem with sexual immorality or passion or impurity or evil desire, stay away from it. Don't go near it. We, it says put to death. That's something we have to do. We have to, by God's power, we have to put to death these things. Don't even go near it. Don't even open the cookie jar lid. It happened to me not so long ago, and I'm not a little boy. I got into the cookies. Oh, man, those are good. These are nice big chocolate cookies that was very slim. Ann got them from Costco somewhere. I don't know why she put them in the pantry. But somehow or another, I got in there, and oh, they were good. I ate, I ate too many. And, and I'm, I'm diabetic, and I'm not supposed to. 
Yeah, that was a sin for me. So we got to stay away from the cookies. We are to stay away from sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and pride. It's really the start of all things. Now he tells us then, he says the things above. Seek those things that are above. That refers to the heavenly realm, to that upward walk. Of the spiritual values that Christ is, that's characterized of Christ, such as tenderness, meekness, patience, wisdom, forgiveness, purity, and love. Here he tells us to put on these things. Again, in verse 12 through 15, in verse 10. People tell me that I'm just a put on. And I am. I'm just a put on. I put on Christ. I put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Compassionate hearts. This is what we put on. Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's a command. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in body, in body and be thankful. What a, what a blessing it is that we are to put on. We put to death or put off the old self and we put on the new self. It's like the changing of clothes. We take off our old clothes and we put on good clothes, new clothes. Here we're to put off the old self, put on the new. We're transformed by renewing of our minds. Then he says, he goes on and he says, set your minds, in verse 2, on things that are above, not on things of this earth. Set your mind is from the word phroneo, and is translated think or have this inner disposition. Uh, one of the translations, maybe it's the old King James, I'm not sure, that it calls, it says, set your affections. So actually, this, is, this word could be infections, our inner disposition, what we really think. Uh, you and I are to live heavenward. We must not only seek heaven, but we must think heaven. Every moment of, this, of our day, we have to have our minds centered on things above. Where Christ is, he says, Obviously, the thoughts that are to fill the believer's mind, you and our minds, is to derive from Scripture. The Bible is the only source of knowledge about the character of God and the values of heaven. And it reminds me of a little story. Well, it's not a story. It's a happening. It's probably been nine years ago now that my little granddaughter, Annika, I was trying to put Austin to bed. He was two, and he's 11 now. But at two years old, he was one wiggly little rascal. And I couldn't get him to sleep. You know how two-year-olds are. And Annika come in. She was about five. She says, Grandpa, can, can I come in and lay down with you guys? I said, sure, come on in. And so she laid down there, and we wasn't laying very long. And she says, can I, can we talk? I said, sure, Annika, what do you want to talk about? She says, let's talk about Jesus in the Bible. Whew, five years old. I thought to myself, she says, at home, Mommy and Daddy, we love to talk about Jesus in the Bible. 
And it reminded me about setting our minds, our hearts on things above. That little girl at five years old had her mind on Jesus. And it really brought me up short. We must desire the Word of God more than our daily food. We must hunger after it. And then I have to ask myself, I love to eat. I like to eat three meals a day. I think probably most of us do, don't we? And more if I can. But you know what? Then I got to thinking, how much do I really love the Word of God? How much? How much do I know about Jesus Christ? How is my relationship with Christ? Those are answers that we all need to ask ourselves this morning. Do I spend every day feeding upon His Word? Do I? Do you? Psalm 1, 2, verse 2 says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night, Speaking of the believer in Christ. I can't even stress this enough this morning. But I'd like to challenge each one of us who are here this morning. I would like to challenge us to every day, starting tomorrow, spending a little time in the Word of God. I don't know if you're accustomed to it. I hope you are. But if you're not, Maybe just start, start reading through the Word uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes a day. You know, we spend a lot of time, I think most of us anyway, doing things that we like to do. It's easy to sit down and turn the TV on watch a show or a ball game or, or something, and next thing you know, an hour is gone. Take just a little of that time and read the Word of God. How can we... I, I, read, a, I read an article not long ago, and it says that the average... A Christian in America spends seven minutes a week in the Word of God. Only seven minutes. Now you tell me, how can we come to know Christ, and we do it only through His Word or the power of the Holy Spirit, how can we come to know Him if we only spend seven minutes a, work, a week in the Word of God? I don't think we can. That's why our churches are filled so often today here in America they're walking away from the true Bible, from the Word, from Scripture. And it's sad. That's why our lifestyles are being lived in ways that does not please the Lord. It's because they don't know it. Unless you know the Word, how can we live it? We have to know the Bible. Spend some time. My wife and I started at the beginning of the year, and and we're reading through the Bible now chronologically. It only takes half, half an hour a day, something like that. But we, sent, we and then we spend some time thinking about what we're reading and, and praying over it and, and just communing with God. I have the time now. I could spend three or four hours a day, and it would it'd be good for us. Sometimes maybe I do. We should spend as much time as you can in the Word, it will transform your life. It's the only thing. If we want to live an upward walk with Christ, we have to live it. There's a famine in our land today. There is. There's a spiritual famine. And the only way that can be remedied, the only way there can be a revival is for us to get into the book, to this word. It is God breathed, as it said. It is the only way that we can produce godly behavior and conquer sin through the Holy Spirit of God, is through His Word. Quote Holiness, it's in our bulletin, is not something to be received by any meeting. It is a life to be lived in detail. 
by Martin Lloyd-Jones. That's the only way. But to live it in detail, we have to know it. Now the resource. But if you, if you don't hear anything else that we've said today, or listen, just remember that. Spend time with the Lord in the Word. Where the resource. Go back to verse 1. He says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The believer's resource is none other than the one who's, who is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the risen and glorified Christ. He's seated at the right hand of God. The Bible gives us many verses about Christ's exalted position. Jesus told his accusers at his trial, he's from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God in Luke twenty-two sixty-nine. 69. On Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he told the crowd that Jesus had been exalted to the right hand of God in Acts two thirty-three. Peter and the other apostles described Jesus to the Sanhedrin as the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior. We see in Acts 5.31. As Stephen was being stoned, he cried out, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God in Acts 7.56. Paul described Jesus as he who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us, Romans 8, 34. He is our intercessor. Because God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. In heaven, as we sang, saw earlier in Ephesians 1, 20. And the writer of Hebrews says, when he had made purifications of sin, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1, 3. He is the one who is at the right hand of God, gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected unto him. 1 Peter 3.22 Because of the exaltation to the Father's right hand, he is the fountain of blessing by his people. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that what? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's the key, isn't it? That's the key, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Does that mean then that I can just ask for a new Lamborghini or Ferrari or Corvette or something like that and God's just going to place it in my driveway? Probably not. Um, that would probably bring a lot of glory to me and a lot of pride, <laughs> and, uh, but it wouldn't do much for God, I don't think. But if I truly, with all my heart, ask God to be more like Jesus, He will bless me with spiritual blessings that I can't even imagine. I think we've all experienced that, haven't we? Through trials, through suffering, through disappointment. But he'll give us joy and peace and love. Again, it reminds me when I was just a boy, 14, uh, my dad died in, uh, in open heart surgery, 11-hour surgery, actually. And I remember that time. I remember just before that time, I had accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I just prayed that uh, you know, God would live his life through me, that he would show me more and more of his grace. God took my father, <laughs> took him home to be with him. But you know, I did. Uh, I learned a lot about God's grace, a lot about his love and his joy and his peace, um, more than anything I would have ever learned otherwise. And it is what characterized my life. 
What was the key? The key is that the Father may be glorified in the Son through our lives. That's what we desire, isn't it? Number four, the reason we see in verse three. He says, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul stresses that living in the heavenlies or living that upward walk is to be the norm for you and I as believers. Because we have died to the old world system. But through our faith in Christ, in His death, burial, and resurrection. Paul wrote in Galatians 6.14, he says, May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You have died indicates a death took place at our salvation. And this is probably a good time. We want to make sure we always share the gospel in our message. And this is a time that if there's anyone, as I look around, I, I think most everyone here that I know of is, is a believer, is saved. But if there's anyone that does not know Christ, we need to realize that Jesus Christ came down from heaven, the perfect Lamb of God, lived a perfect life. And He went to the cross and He gave His life and shed His blood, a ransom for our sins. He took upon my sin and your sin on Himself for those of us who would believe. And he was buried, and three days later, he rose again for our justification. If you believe that this morning, that's the gospel. He says, if you believe that, then you're saved. If there's anyone here that does not believe that, I would pray that the Holy Spirit of God would work in your heart and cause you to come to him and be saved. He goes on, he says, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are living a new life in Christ. Romans 12, I believe chapter uh, 1, verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? How? by the renewing of our minds, that we might prove what is that good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformation by Christ, by His power, by the renewing of our minds, our hearts. In what sense did we die? The penalty for sin has been paid. By union with Jesus Christ, we died the required death in Him. The penalty has been paid for our sin and can never, ever claim us again. Its presence and its power still affect us. That's why we have to put off, put to death these things because of this flesh until the Lord calls us home. But it can never condemn us. For those of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We're fully, our sins have fully been paid for once and for all. Not only, not only have we died to sin, but our lives are hidden with Christ in God what does that mean? Well, number one, believers, we share a common life with the Father and with the Son. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. And second, that new life is concealed 
from the world. We aren't, as we said, to love the world. We aren't not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. And third, believers are eternally secure. We talked about that, I think, three or four weeks ago. The blessings of salvation are an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1.4. We have a home in heaven that's already reserved for us. We have our reservation bought and paid for. Those to whom the Son gives eternal life shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my Father's hand, John 10.28 says. If we're His, we're safe and secure in Christ. No man can snatch us out of the Father's hand. We are hidden away deep in the shelter of the hand of our God. No passage says it better than Romans chapter 8, verse 36 and 39. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a promise. What a promise. All the riches of our eternal God are available to those of us whose lives are hidden with Christ in God. That brings us to number five, the revelation. He says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul adds a wonderful thought, doesn't he? He describes Christ as our life. Christ as our life. Christ does not just give us life, but He is our life. He is the one who lives His life through us. As we see in Galatians 2.20, we'll quote again, I love that verse, probably one of my favorite verses. I have a lot of them, but that's one of my favorite. I have been crucified with Christ. And he says, And it's not no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. (laughs) You see, it's no longer me, but it's he who lives his life in and through my life. If there's any good that anyone sees in my life, it's only Jesus Christ. There's nothing good in this man. Nothing. I'm worthless. Only but by the grace of God. And by His grace, I'm a saint. Safe and secure. But in my own flesh, I have nothing to offer. It's only Jesus Christ. I love that hymn where it says, Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. I want that on my tombstone. Yeah, nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. The key to living living the risen life is to have a Christ-centered life, as we saw this morning. The Son of God, not this present world, is the center of your and my life. And one of these days, hopefully it's sooner rather than later, those of us who belong to Him are going to appear with Him in glory. I can't wait. 
we're going to go and be with Christ. All these things, you know, this old world, as I said when I got up this morning, we can look to the left and we look to the right. We look all around us in this world, and it's confusing. It's discouraging. But we have to keep our eyes centered upward. But we're going to one day go and be with the Lord. 2 Timothy 4.8, he says, and this is when uh, uh, Paul was about to leave this life, he said, I have kept the, I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the, I, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but to also all who have loved his appearing. That's us. Paul was looking forward to that time. I think one time he said, he said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He said, I'd rather depart and go and be with the Lord, which is far better. But he said, it's still needful that I stay. He was still needed. And you know, I, I think that sometimes I'll say that. I really feel that way. I'd love to go and be with the Lord, which is far better. But you know, I, I'm, I'm still needed. The Lord still has a work for me to do. There's still people outside of Jesus Christ. We are to, to evangelize personally and also uh, all of us together. We want to share Christ to all those whom God has chosen before the very foundation of the world. They're out there. It's up to us to take the gospel to every nation. All around us here in the in, right here in Modesto. Let's preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and wisdom. And Titus 2.13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. What a wonderful time that's going to be. We who are in Christ will one day appear with Him in glory. We will see our Savior face to face. The one who saved us by His grace Praise the Lord this morning. In closing, what should our response, what should your response be this morning as we listen to this little message in Colossians? How is your upward walk? How are you walking? Are you walking in the world, or are you walking for Christ? I had to ask myself that. Are you walking in love? Ephesians 5.2. Are you walking in the Spirit? Galatians 5.16. Are you walking in the light? 1 John 1, 7. Are you walking in Christ and Him? Colossians 2, 6. Are you walking in a worthy manner? Colossians 1, 10. Are you walking humbly before your God? Micah 6, 8. Are you walking in newness of life? Romans 6, 4. Are you walking by faith? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And are you walking in His ways, God's ways? Deuteronomy 10, 12. That is the upward walk. That's how 
God desires for each one of us who are truly believers in him, who are possessors of this gospel, not just professors. There's a lot of those. But we want to be true possessors of Christ and of the word. And my prayer is that this is the desire of every heart here who is a believer in Jesus Christ, that our walk each day would be worthy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we have set our minds on Him, on things above, and not on things of this earth, it will prevent us from fulfilling the desires of our flesh. And we will bring honor and glory to our great God and our Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, just now this morning, we just rejoice in you. We're so thankful, Father, for your word. Because, Lord, without it, we are just literally lost and undone. We need it. We need your word each and every day, each and every second, each and every moment of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. Lord, we want to come to know you more and more. And the only way that we can do that is through your word so we can live that upward walk, that walk that will bring praise and honor and glory to your name. That's our desire, Father. There is nothing, nothing in this world that means anything more to us than walking according to your word. Father, we know that if we do that, it will bring honor to your name. And I pray that for each soul here this morning, that we'll have a hunger. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us a desire. Give us a desire that we might know you better, that we'll fellowship with you, we'll commune with you, and that our lives will show forth the very life of Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you and praise you for what you will do in our lives for the glory of God. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.